Greg Sills, how you doing? All good, Mike. Appreciate you doing this, brother. All right, so listen, uh, I know you're taking a lot of heat from the people in Philly. I see it all the time. What are you doing to the people in Philly? Telling the truth, like you did. <laughs> hey, I've, I've learned one thing, Mike. People in Philly sometimes hear what they want to see, okay? And so, you know, they they want you to say something that kind of what they're seeing. And if you don't, and it goes a little off, I see why you and Angelo dominated because, <laughs> well, you're, no, you're, all, Mike, but, but... you're not controversial. You're just a truth teller. I thought I was the truth, Ellery. That's why I try to do it. Uh, but the first, before I answer the question, because you pose a very good question here on whether he's worth it. Um, so where are you right now on, on Jalen? Because I've been following you for, for you know most of the year. You weren't that keen with him, and you didn't think he was going to do this or that. And by, by, by the playoffs, he would have been a liability. Have you flopped on this? No, no. I And, and Mike, when I tell people, when people go, have you flopped on it? No. How I always change my opinion is by the player's performance. If the player gets better, hey, well, let me ask you this, Mike. Did you flop on Wentz? Did, were you sold when they gave Wentz the hundred and some odd million dollar deal and you thought when he was finishing second in the MVP? Did you think he was the franchise quarterback then? Yeah, I, I, I guess I did. Well, um, well, well, wait a minute, though, Mike. That's not your – what I'm saying is his performance, Wentz's performance – is what changed the narrative. And so to me, Jalen getting better and better and seeing how he's progressed and what kind of guy he is, I think it obviously, I mean, it's, I, I'd be an idiot to sit here and go, this kid is, I, I've actually, Mike, never seen a rise going from last year, this time, April 19th, a year ago, were we not both saying this? Is this guy yeah. the guy? I I agree with you on that. We had when we, he first came into the season, he had a lot to show us. Still, we we still weren't sold on it. Uh, but the, the, let's go back to the question. On here's the thing that I've learned, Sills, is that it's not whether you're worth it or not. It's what the going rate is. And uh, he got them to a position where they had no choice. Like he took them to the Super Bowl, so they they had no out on what they were going to have to pay it. And, and the agent held fast to it. And I think the Eagles think they're, they're getting a bargain here by getting in first. And, uh, you know, they, uh, Burrow and, and, and Herbert will, will even get more. So, but 51 million AAV and the high state player currently in, in the league is pretty substantial. Uh, but they, they had no way out of it. Like they couldn't say to him, well, listen, you had a great year but you need uh, another year to prove it to us before we give you that money. That would have been hell to pay for the Eagles. The, you know, the, there would have been a revolt from the fans. They knew they had to do it now, and they looked at the going rate and said, okay, let, let's do this. How they were able to manipulate the salary cap. I, listen, I teach sports law, right? I kind of think I know the, the caps in, in various leagues. Uh, I don't know how the, they managed to get four years at this cap value. I, I mean – I have to look closer at it, but what they did was a miracle, frankly. I, I, I talked to Bruce Allen about this, and I'm going to tell you what they did. They went on the offensive side, Mike, and it's pretty remarkable on what that owner did. This doesn't start with Howie. This starts with the owner. And here's what Bruce said. How many owners do you know, Mike, are going to go like this? Well, let's give the guy more guaranteed money up front, Pay the front end of the contract up. Give Lane that huge money on that extension. Get, they even gave Slay more money to re-sign, and they gave Jalen. Jalen's going to make $170 million over the three next three years. So they front-ended it, which means it gave them cap release and cap relief because the owner goes, you're right, Lane's worth it. Mulata's worth it. Uh, Goddard's worth it. Um, the quarterback's worth it. So that's why when you look at the cap numbers, do you know Daniel Jones is going to make more money than yeah. Jalen Hurts? And do you know he makes $5 million yeah, yeah, less yeah. than Kyler they, they, Murray? They, they it's remarkable, break, Mike. Yeah, they got a break in that it was an extension rather than a brand new contract. So they took advantage of that. Now, uh, they're spreading that early money. They can they can spread it over the the length of the contract. So 
that, that's where it comes out a little smaller. They're, 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 and they're smart about this. They know the salary cap is going to keep going up and up and up. It's, it's, yep. This league is just going to keep going up and up and up. So when they have to count for $60 million on the cap or whatever it is down the road, it won't affect them because the cap is higher. They can manage it. So it was really a smart, calculated move by the Eagles. Now, is he worth it? I, you know, I... Listen, I, I assume he is. I mean, but don't it, you think he has to win the Super Bowl to validate it at least? Yeah, just like every franchise quarterback yeah, has to win the Super Bowl. You know that that's what the expectations are. Uh, and uh, he should listen. I look at him and I go, okay, he said he's at a risk because of how he plays, but he's so strong that it doesn't seem to affect him like it affects other players. So that that worry is very mild for me now. Will he regress? I mean, I don't know. I think he's learned how to play the position in, in that one year. So I can't imagine he's going to forget about how to play the position. He plays it with a lot of confidence and believes in himself that he knows how to play it. And guys like that aren't fragile. Like Wentz, you can see, was fragile. Wentz, you know, let other stuff bother him. This guy's like a pod, Dan. He's 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 really he's like artificial intelligence. If, if you hear, he's a robot. So no, no, I don't no. Know if those, and Mike, you know, you know what Phil Simms said last Friday, and I never thought of this when it came to how he plays the game. He goes, Dan, don't you understand? There's more violence and more unpredictability in the pocket than in open field. And I go, so what do you mean? He goes, well, if you're a smart runner, you have more determination on what kind of contact you're going to take in open space. And Jalen, unlike Josh Allen or even Lamar, those guys play with such aggressiveness, Mike. They put themselves in a position to be hurt. Jalen doesn't do that. Chicago game, it was inevitable it was going to happen, something like that. But Phil thinks that he's more responsible in open space, and he knows when to get down, which means to me he sees the game better than those other yeah, two Yeah, I, I think he's, he's working on that. I mean, there are times he'll take on somebody. But, but I think – he takes on somebody because he realizes, hey, I'm stronger than that dude anyway. So yeah. like, why, why wouldn't I take him on? I mean, it's, it's a pretty phenomenal thing when he, he he knows his strength and he works at his strength. And uh, he's, you know, is he the strongest quarterback in the league? When you look at him physically, he probably is. Right? So Yeah, agreed. I mean, listen, five years, six years, they got him. He's in a position that if you to, to get another monster contract at age 29, which is just <sighs> – incredible to, uh, to, to hear but I, they did the right thing they had to do the right thing it was the going rate there was no way out of it uh once jones got 45 million what are you going to you going to argue with his agent uh by the way he's not worth 50. Wait, really that team just gave this schmo 45 <laughs> 45 million dollars my guy went to the super bowl and, and you, you're going to uh, chones me like out of five, five million dollars come on hey here, here here's something else too that I'm sure that – I think this is really the golden nugget of this whole contract. Mike, has the Eagles ever given – basically, I think they gave Jalen Hurts a guaranteed contract. And when you give a guy a no trade, that means you have complete control of your own destiny and your career. You can't send me to some shithole like the Jets. You can't just go to the Texans and go, here's – you can't do that. The Eagles have so much confidence in him. Mike, there's a value on that no trade. Okay? I mean, to me, how many players have you ever seen had a no trade on their on their contract and he has complete control of his destiny? That's how much the Eagles believe in him. That's quite a statement from that organization. Yeah, but, you know, I look at the no trade, Dan, as more like uh, icing on a cake. I it, it, like he to trade him at this point with the money he's making, he would have to regress terribly for them to even think about trading him, right? If he regresses and he has a fifty-one million dollar price tag, I don't, I don't know what the market is for him. So I think the no trade looks good on paper, but uh, you know if you really dig into it, they, I don't know if that's a factor anyway. They're not going to trade him because they expect him to be at at, at the same level, and, and if he totally falls off the map, that's the only reason they would think about trading him. And by then, who's going to I, listen, I know somebody. So if he drafted. blows his knee out, Mike, next year, you don't think yeah. that trade, you don't think that no trade has well, any value to it? Value? If somebody blows their knee out, is the team going to say, oh, I'll take him for $51 million, even though I don't even know if he can play anymore? 
see, they did it with Wentz. Wentz was making twenty-two million. Like this is like at a, another uh, echelon of price tag. So I, I don't know. I, I I think it looks good, more good on paper than it really in reality it is. Okay, let's get to the draft here, man. I'll tell you something, man. You guys, some of you guys in Philly, man, are psychotic. You'd rather take Miles Murphy at ten than hey. If you could draft Brian Westbrook at 10, or if you could draft um, Derrick Henry at 10 to put behind Jalen Hurts, would you do it? Um, hold on one second. I got somebody knocking at my door, believe it or not, at this point. Do like, it. Go it's, ahead. It's, go it's, ahead. It's, go it's ahead. Funny, Let me answer the door and tell them on a live show. Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a little scotch whiskey. Hey, nothing wrong with a vat of whiskey, man. <laughs> hey, sure. <laughs> oh, good here. I love that, man. Very good. Here's what it, here's what it was. No, no, no. I'm this is to, what makes you Mike Missinelli, man. I'm all over it, dude. I'm trying to do this thing in my garage where I'm, I'm putting up shelving in my garage. My garage was a mess, so I'm trying to organize it. And, and my buddy, I, are you going to put a studio in there? No, the studio is here in this in this little okay. office. The garage, I'm trying to put shelving into storage and stuff like that. And I had a faulty stud finder, Sills. That stud finder lied to me. Like he told me there was going to be a stud here. I drilled to the wall. It was only drywall. So I called my buddy, who's got all this sophisticated equipment. I said, "Give me, give me bring over a, a a stud finder." So that's where it was. <laughs> okay. So wait. All right. That that's a perfect lead in, actually. If you had a stud running back at 10 that could be an all pro and that could help take the carries away from Jalen Hurts and that you would have an elite back behind him, would you not? Say you don't feel comfortable at 10. Trade down to 14 with the Patriots. Take him at 14. Doesn't that guy, he's the second ranked player in the draft, Mike. He's not the 18th. Don't isn't this about the Super Bowl? You're not in a rebuild. Yeah, but the, I I read this team from a million miles away. That's not the type of thing that they're going to do. So I I kind of put it out of my mind. I tried to I tried to zero in on what the, their options are here, and here's what I think they're thinking because I pretty much know how Howie and those guys think about where the important positions are. So at ten, if Jalen Carter slides and he's available, he starts seven eight. They make a move. There's not a question in my mind that they make a move. He's this guy, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, okay. Guys, uh, Mike, I you're think he's – I I've never compared him to this guy. I think he's this guy, Jalen Carter. Yeah, and I think they know it too. And if if he starts to slide, like they won't go up to five to get him. Uh, but if, if he starts to slide, I think they'll make an aggressive move. Other than that, they could sit there, and, and if they if he's not an option, I think that will take Paris Johnson. That's what See, they do. That's not terrible because it helps. Yeah, Jaylen. well, that, that, that's what they do. This is where they value it. So, um, you know, I, I'm not buying the Lucas Van Ness thing. I, I is is it possible that they, they grab they, they look at Nolan Smith at ten? Maybe, but he's still you know, a little light in the loafers. I I don't Dude, know. I think I, he's I, a thirty I, guy, Mike. Yeah. I don't think he's Mike. So, I agree. You, so wait a minute. So people fell in love last year with Jordan Davis's combine the same way they're falling in love with Nolan Smith's combine. And both guys last year, Nolan Smith played eight ball games. I don't know, man. I mean, one thing I'm noticing about these Georgia guys, they're not awful productive. I mean, here's what I, here's what they're, they're not do. awful productive. I, here's what they could do also. If, if Paris Johnson and, and they can't get Carter 10, I think they trade back. I think in trading back, they, they fulfill those middle round draft picks that they don't have now. And then maybe use those to package with pick number 30 if B. John Robinson slides and, and, and he's available at 20. That's what I think they could possibly do. And See, I think Dallas wants him at 26. Yeah, and, and so maybe they're enamored enough to do that with the running back, even though I don't even think they would do that. But trading back they can get a starting cornerback probably uh, for depth uh, with, if they trade back from 10. 
So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I think uh, uh, this, this is a very fluid draft for them, and they're just going to keep their eyes on, on how the board's moving, and if Carter slides, they're going to pounce. Here, here, here's what I have been trying to tell folks. You know, everyone looks back at Emmett Smith's career, and they go, well, Emmett had the better old line than what Barry had. And I'm like, that's not true. I was in Dallas. And everyone's like, wait a minute, Sills. Look at that line he had. Well, Landry had that line too. That he had Tune for two years. He had Gogan for three years. He had Nate for four years. I mean, he had Crawford Kerr for five years. Who made that old line elite? Emmett. You have an old line, Mike. Why not put personally, Mike, the guys you have running the ball, they're dudes. They're not elite. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think they have to upgrade. I, I totally agree with that. And B. John Robinson, I love him. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, their mindset is such that they just they don't love like other people love. You know, so like, the running back, they, it's preposterous to them to take a running back that high. What do you think it's more likely, Mike, that they make the move at 10 or 30? I think it's more likely they make the move at 10. I agree. Because I don't think that either those two guys that we talked about earlier, uh, Paris Johnson and, and Carter, are going to be there. So uh, I think that gives them no choice but to trade back because they're enamored with – with they don't like having no draft picks in the middle here. Who do you think has more pressure on him going into this year, Brian Johnson or Sean Desai? Well, is that – see, this is an underplayed story. And I know we talked about it when it happened, that it's really tough to adjust the new coordinators. Uh, I, I think the offense – will be fine with Brian Johnson. And I think that's because of his connection with Hertz. I think they've got enough talent, except for running back. The offensive line is pretty good. The side is going to be an interesting thing because everybody hated Gannon, even though he was, his defenses were very efficient. Right? Boy, what he did was efficient, whether, whether you liked his lack of aggression or not. Agreed. And, and so you know, the side, I think, has a lot more pressure on him. They, they don't have linebackers here. I mean, they're, they're still scrambling with the linebackers. They – they kind of need a safety. Like I don't know if they're if they're solid at safety. The cornerbacks are fine. They they need to get pressure from the outside, which is still debatable here. So the side definitely has more pressure on. How about this too, Mike? You know, I and, and you you'll correct me if you think I'm wrong on this. People keep throwing the Buddha Baker out now, and I'm like, that's not a Howie guy, man. How he looks for C.J. Gardner Johnson. He looks for the Kaiser Whites. He scours the rosters that have really good evaluating general managers and front offices and looks for underplayed players. Think about, I mean, look, Mickey Loomis, he, he's a good talent evaluator down in New Orleans. What did he see? He saw an $837,000 corner that they used in the in nickel, and they said, why don't we bring him up here? He made him a six million dollar guy. Kaiser White now five and a half million. An undrafted free agent linebacker. TJ is now making seven. I mean, do you agree? And plus the cap hit, Mike. Do you know if they brought Buda Baker in, he'd be more of a cap hit to the Eagle cap over the next three years than what Jalen Hurts would be with his thing? Am I right when I say that? That's it. It's not that he, they don't want. They wouldn't want him. It's that it's awful pricey. And they don't really value that safety position that much. No, they don't. And they acquired a guy, and they, and they think that uh, Blankenship can play. Uh, but I, I don't know if they can or not. And N'Kobe Dean, they're putting him into a big spot. I didn't really get the impression they were that enamored with him last year. So, uh, you know, there's there's some questions there. And, you know, Josh Sweat, is he going to be a, a – a, is he going to get heat, more heat on the quarterback than he did last year? I mean – what's Cox going to do for him? What's Brandon Graham going to do for him? I, I think they need somebody they can rely on. And that's maybe the draft where it comes in with the draft. What do you, what's your biggest concern now with where they are on April 19th? By the way, I still think there's some shopping to do after June one, because as you know, that's almost like a, a 2.0 version of free agency because cap cap casualties happen on June one. That's how they got Bradbury. And that's how you're able to kind of go in the market there and look and see if guys are open because of money issues. Um, what's your biggest concern right now with them uh, trying to repeat as NFC champions? Well, um, 
defensively is is always a concern for me. It, it let me let, let me let me throw this at you, Mike. My biggest concern is the Kobe Dean and Jordan Davis. Are they going to be players or are they going to just be pretenders? Because yeah, I, I, you, I, I, I right now they're the show Dean, ponies. The Kobe Dean worries me a little more than uh, Jordan Davis does. I think Jordan Davis is going to be fine. Uh, I think with increased playing time, I think he's got a chance to come into his own. Um, the depth positions, like, you know, they lost two guys that I really thought were really key to them last year, and that was Hargrave and C.J. Gardner-Johnson. And, uh, you know, I, they were the two priorities for me. Now, I know they couldn't have matched with Hargrave got. I get it. But C.J. Gardner-Johnson, I think, is a mistake. And, and I think they're going to, you know, they're, that, that might hurt them because he filled in a lot of roles for them. And he's, you know, listen, he's kind of a, a nut, but you know, I liked I liked the way he played. So uh, I, I'm going to be looking to see if they can replace those positions on a consistent basis. These guys have to be consistent. They're going to throw in there. Blankenship had moments, uh, but, but is he going to be a consistent player every, every down for this team and every game? I'm going to leave you with this question, and this is the final question for you here. At the end of the day, when Jeffrey Lurie was making his decision on who to put his trust in, Howie Roseman or Doug Peterson, the owner chose right, didn't he? Yeah. It, he did. He chose right. I mean, I, I was on the other end. I thought that that was the wrong move, Mike, to fire a Super Bowl coach who won two division titles an NFC championship and brought a Super Bowl to your city going up broad with this guy. And all of a sudden you fire him two years later and you stick with the guy who was in the broom closet <laughs> for the Chip Kelly years. He comes out of the broom closet, a better general manager. All that true. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. How he wasn't going to go anywhere. I, I, he was kept in storage. For, for Jeffrey Lurie. Uh, I, he was I, on I, layaway, I, Mike. I, thought, uh, I had uh, lost the uh, faith in Doug Peterson. I, you know, that year was was a bad huh. year. You know, that four-win year. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I the more I looked at Doug Peterson, the more I thought it was just lightning in a bottle. They won that Super Bowl, not his expertise. So I, I wasn't that, that you know, hurt that they, they got rid of him. Now, who they were going to bring in, I, I was a shock. And... And that's that surprised me more than anything that that this guy got it together that quickly with the team to the point where they get to the Super Bowl. I, I want to sneak one more in on you. Let me sneak one more, Mike. Okay. Before you go back to your uh, your cabinets here, let me let me <laughs> let me do this here. Here's why I don't know. Now the Eagles just signed a wide receiver from Atlanta to potentially compete um, against Quez. But here, yeah. follow me here on this. I think. Quez makes more sense to stick with him because what makes more sense and what fears, what would make me have more fear as DC? Um, a guy that has five or 10 catches like Zach Pascal or a guy that runs four, two. See yeah, to me, the illusion of the guy running the four, two, Mike, that frightens me more. And I got a game plan that more than I do a guy with 55 catches. Uh, you're totally right. We talked about this a lot during the uh, after doing post game shows with, with Seth and Derek Gunn and Devin Caney. Uh, they they ran a lot of fly patterns with, uh, with with Brown and where they should have been running him with Quez, but Quez lost them. Whatever he was doing in practice, he wasn't competing. He wasn't competing for balls, and they saw that. And coaches see that, and they don't they lose trust. So he's going to have to prove a lot that that he can be a tougher receiver. That, that he showed last year. Because you're right, Zach, Zach Pascal it, it does not give them as good a weapon as Quez Watkins, but they were so frustrated by his inability to compete on balls that they, they just lost faith in him. So, yeah, I, I, he's got a chance to lose his job unless he turns into a different Quez. Absolutely. All right, Mike, um, I, I figured out why you and Angelo destroyed that market for all those years. <laughs> It, it's just too easy, dude. <laughs> Mike, it really is. I mean, <laughs> you say Listen, anything opposite of something, it's just not going to work. My, for people. My, my, I love my people here in Philly. And uh, all I tried to give them was, was what I thought was the honest truth. And if it was contrary to what they thought, I wanted to engage them. Like, okay, why do you think that? Well, here's what, look, maybe you should look at this other side. That was the fun of Sports Talk Radio. In it is. 
You know, it's and, the and- banner. You know, we can't do that anymore in radio because that shit's gone away now, Mike. But I know, you know, when you, when, you know, when you could go back and forth to me, I never liked the yes guys calling my program. I always liked the dudes that go, you're out of your mind. You have no understanding of what you're talking about. I can't believe you actually played. And that's the guy I like. You know what I mean? Those are the guys that I like. By the way, I do believe it's one of the most intelligent cities I've ever spoken sports to because I'll tell you what, they'll call you back and go, hey, on March 10th, you said this bullshit about this guy here. No, remember now, here we are, right? The biggest wrestling match I ever had with the people here was I didn't like Furcon Cork Moss from the jump. And all the, whenever he would have – he would have a game where he would make a couple threes, and I would get pounded. You don't know what you're talking about. Blah, blah, blah. And I just sat there and go, okay, yeah, all right, we'll see. He's a lost soul now. He's not even an entity in the NBA. So people in Philly, I was right about Furcon. At least throw me that bone. Hey, absolutely. And, and, and Mike, I love how people now have flipped on Harden. Hey, Harden's an assist guy. Hoss, you didn't bring that guy into Philly to be an assist guy. Yeah, <laughs> I and, mean, and, and, don't, I don't flip flop it. on him. That's uh, not why you brought him to Philly is to be an assist guy for Embiid. I, I want this to be, I'm watching Seth Curry the other night. Now, you know, he's pretty much beat. Uh, he's beat up, right? He's done. I mean, the dynasty's and, and when over. They, when they made that trade, it was you. the people here lamented the fact that they lost Seth Curry and Andre Drummond. I'm going, are you people nuts? What's going on? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Seth Curry and Andre Drummond? Hey, what do you make of Josh Harris buying the commanders? You know, it's unsettling. <laughs> I don't know why. Wait, wait, wait. why is it unsettling? Well, it's funny because we were talking about this on my podcast the other day. It, it, does, it doesn't feel right to have an owner divide his loyalty because it's like it tells huh. the fans that they're not – that. You know, this guy's just here to spin the, the corporate wheel, and he, he's not really personally invested. We want our owners to be personally invested in a team. He's got – like, he looks at it, they're chess pieces to him. It's a different type of thing. I'm not saying it's wrong because this is what guys do, Capital venture capitalists. They know they're not going to lose any money. Sports teams are the way to go. And, but but you divide the loyalties. It's like, oh you're oh you're gonna put all, you're gonna put some of your energy into the Jersey Devils, and now you're gonna put a lot of energy into the Commanders. But well, what about our Sixers? That's all we care about. We don't care about the damn Devils and the Commanders. Do you do you think the owner of the Eagles is the greatest owner in team sports history? No, <laughs> no, I, I I can't. I go back and forth with Lori. I can't warm up hundred <laughs> percent. You, I, just, you go I, I don't know what it is, Dan. I don't know what it is. I've never been able to warm up 100% on him. Uh, but I Why? Tell me. I tell, please educate me. I, I don't know. It's just a feel. You know, sometimes you get a feel and you go, eh, I don't know about this guy. You know, I, I don't know. Like Middleton, I can look at Middleton and I go, he looks like a regular guy who's invested in his team's fortunes. He wants to spend money. Uh, and uh, Philly, sorry. I, I, he's done nothing wrong. I just said nothing wrong, so I, I I'm probably I probably have a misguided uh, opinion, but I'm like I like him eighty percent. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> that means you like him Monday through Thursday. <laughs> I, I guess I don't know what it is, but I, in, in general, rich guys bug me, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of there with him a little bit, Mike. It's it's always a great lesson in Philly sports with you, man, because. Again, I, I had a conversation the other night with Angelo, and he's like, and he said the same thing that you put on the text to me. He goes, you know, he goes, you're, you're, you're killing it. And I was like, hey, man, you know, Mike just sent that. He goes, keep it up. And I go, yeah, I take a lot of shit. I go, and by the way, if I say anything, it's like you guys. People write columns. They get pissed off. Our writers get mad. Well, you, 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 if, if you don't put a quote right, somebody – goes crazy on you you're i'm like what the what's going I on i tweeted here? out that i was coming on your show what and, and, and somebody tweeted back i said what do you want i said he's been hating a lot on philly what do you want me to ask him and, i and, don't hate on philly yeah, I, mean, I was just playing with him because uh, i wanted to get a response and one guy wrote back ask him if he has cte <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> well, do my, my, my... You're, you're, still, you're healthy right yeah, well, I probably a CTE, not from football. My wife throwing me on my head. <laughs> you, you, you have to understand, there's more physical violence in my – I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding there. And, Mike, listen, I appreciate it, man. And, by the way, it's not hating. It's just telling the truth. I mean, 
Bro, when you've got a football team and you're this close to winning the Super Bowl, I'm not drafting Miles Murphy at listen, 10. Listen, you know you're not hating. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. I go, say I that know again. you're not hating. But when, when you say something that's contrary, what they what they really believe is true, then they, they give you that label. You're hating. It can't be it can't be that maybe you're right, or it can't be that, well, maybe I should listen to the opinion and re- reevaluate it. But it's like it's it's not what I think. So he's a hater. <laughs> Mike, I'm always here for you, man, and I really appreciate you. We go back and forth so much. And, and and by the way, I plaster still to this day the book that you wrote on Jerome and I. I will always – and by the way, too, all – hey, you're Penn State guys. Like, what is his name? Radich, who was the center, Wisniewski, and all – the only guy I don't talk to. I will not talk to Schaefer. Okay, but DJ and all them guys – Okay, he sucked the quarterback, and I killed him on the first. I was never going to talk to him, but Shane Collins, a friend of mine, and every time I go, oh yeah, man, we had we had such a good game, and they always they, they'll send me the ring, and I'll go like this, you dicks. <laughs> hey man, the that was time. such a great night, though, Mike. I'll never forget it because it's the greatest night hey, in man, my opinion in college football team. history. You proud playing with that team and in that game, it was a special game. That's why I wrote a book on it. And and uh, but guess what? Well, I don't know. Can I make a prediction that they're yeah. finally going to contend for a national championship next year? Is that possible? The Penn State Nittany Lions? Are you feeling it? Are you feeling I think it Penn State still? has a better chance than UM getting back to where they were. I just, to me personally, I think James Franklin. I think they can recruit. I don't know if they can develop. Okay, they've got three premier skill players this year, brother. Well, the they, they well, the and, but they special. let the kid from Pence. They let the kid go to Kentucky, Mike. They couldn't yeah, keep Levis. Listen, they're they're starting. This kid is is phenomenal, and he's gonna he's gonna really impress this year. I think. It's, look, I I I think they had a really good bounce back year this year. And by the way, that kid Joey Porter. You know what Manny says about him? He in a corner. Really? He thinks he's a safety. Oh boy. He thinks he well, ain't fast uh, enough. Well, we'll That's see. between us. I, I like the way he plays, so we'll see what happens. No, 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 no. I do too. But I think he's a slot corner kind of guy. Maybe. I think you drop him in there, and I think he's one of those guys that you play back there because he gets kind of lost out there sometimes in coverage, but he's a hitter. And so, you know, to me, Eagles hitters had, are in that safety yeah, slot the position. Had him in. The Eagles had him in. He looks like C.J. Gardner Johnson. No, I think he's made. good. I think he could. I think he could play that Gardner Gardner Johnson position. Well, maybe if they trade back, that's the guy that they'll get. I think Washington's getting him. Well, well that's a possibility. I think Washington, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Right, I'll talk to you. You got it. That's my friend, Mike Masinelli, giving us an education there. Please hit the like button. Hour number three already. Holy cow! Please hit the like button. Keep it here on the National Football Show. Go to get your game. 